Hey you folks, Quilateen here, and welcome to a sort of review slash preview of the 5th edition Player's Handbook. Wizards of the Coast was kind enough to send me a copy, and I've been very excitedly looking through this. In the background, you can see me trying to uh, make a couple of characters, just to try to help learn the rules a little bit. Now, of course, the basic rules for 5th edition are available for free online. There'll be a link down below in the description uh, that'll bring you to the Wizards of the Coast website that will have the free basic rules. The basic rules include everything you need to know about combat and spell casting and all that kind of jazz, equipment and whatnot, as well as the four basic races and four basic classes. Now, what does the player handbook include? And you know, is it is it worth picking up? Well, I can't answer that question for you. That's going to depend entirely on how much of a fanboy you are and if you've got 25 bucks to spend. So, uh, let's dive right in here. So um, right away, let's let's go and look at the the races that are included here. Of course, there are the four basic races, dwarf, elf, halfling, and human. Additionally, there are extra special races, I suppose. The dragonborn, the gnome, the half-elf, the half-orc, and the tiefling or typhling, depending on how you like to say it. Now, I believe the dwarf is more or less unchanged from the basic rules. The elf does include the description of the drow or dro variant, the dark elf, um, which is perfectly balanced in line with the other races, unlike, say, maybe, you know, the old school dark elves, which were like crazy, crazy sauce. Um, the, the most notable thing is they do have superior dark vision, they have double dark vision, but they have sensitivity sunlight, which is back, and that makes me very happy, as well as the ability to cast a few spells, kind of a uh, dan dancing lights, fairy fire, and darkness, which are, of course, classic trademark abilities of the dark elf. Um, I don't think the halfling has changed, nor the human. So very quickly, and I'm not going to go and run down what all the stats are in here, uh, but the dragonborn, of course, sort of a half-dragon-blooded uh, critter that gets a bonus to strength and a little bit to charisma, also gains the ability to breathe well, I was going to say breathe fire, but I guess it depends on what your draconic ancestry are. You get to choose a dragon color slash metal, um, and those all have associated damage types, acid, lightning, fire, uh, poison, or cold, for example. So depending on exactly what color of dragon you pick, you might have a 30-foot line attack or a 15-foot cone and uh, have that particular damage type. In addition to that, you will have a resistance to that element, which means you take half damage to that, which is a very cool and fun race to play. I love the gnomes. I think they're great. Uh, they do have dark vision. They're small and walk slightly slower at 25 feet. They come with two sub races, the forest gnomes, which are really the kind of classic ones uh, from the base edition. Oh, of course, the the base gnomes get a uh, plus two bonus to intelligence. The forest gnomes get a plus one to dexterity. They're also natural illusionists. So they can do minor illusions as well as speak with small beasts, which is great and classic. The rock gnomes are kind of interesting. They do get the plus one to constitution score um, and artificial artificers lore and stuff. But they also gain the tinker ability, which allows them to make little clockwork devices that uh, do neat little things. They're not really like combat stuff, but they're great personality, and, and I really love it. Uh, I like the uh, treatment of the half-elves in this version. Uh, being a player of 3.5 ed, to me, the half-elves were never a very impressive race. They certainly got a better treatment in 4th edition, and even then, though, I don't know if I was sold on the half-elf. This time around, uh, they are quite nice. I get a plus two to their charisma, and they pick two other ability scores and give a plus one to each one of those. Uh, so whereas most of the races end up with like a plus one to something and a plus one to something else, or sorry, a plus two to something and a plus one to something else, the half elves get a plus two, a plus one, and another plus one. They do have dark vision. They've got fey ancestry, which gives them the, uh, the sort of advantage against charm and sleep. They also automatically get proficiency in two additional skills. Um... Altogether, very, very cool, lots of flexibility, and can uh, fit a lot of roles. Obviously, relatively charisma-centric, but other than that, I, I really like them. Although, I might even like the half-orcs a little bit better. Obviously, they've got the bonus to strength and constitution that you would expect. They've got dark vision, they've got proficiency and intimidation, but what's really cool is they have relentless endurance. When they drop to zero hit points, uh, assuming they didn't just die outright, if they drop to zero hit points, instead, they can choose to be at one hit point. Now, they can only use that basically once per day, once per long rest, but once per long rest, and I mean, again, effectively, it only sort of kind of heals one hit point um, in a sense, but what it means is they just keep fighting and they just keep killing stuff, which is awesome. I really love it. They also get savage attacks, which is when they roll a critical hit, instead of rolling sort of double normal damage, they roll one additional die as well. So they basically get times three crits built in. When we talk about the barbarian, you'll see why I like these guys so very much. 
And then finally, the Tiefling, uh, they get the plus one to intelligence and the plus two to charisma. They get dark vision, they get resistance to fire, and very much like the Drow, they get a variety of spell casting options. They get Thaumaturgy at will. At third level, they get Hellish Rebuke once per day. And at fifth level, they get Darkness, which I think is quite spiffy. All right, classes, and there are a lot of them. Um, I'm, I'm not doing the math and I'm not checking anything, but I'm pretty sure there are more classes in this player's handbook than there have ever been in the basic player's handbook of any previous edition. Those classes are Barbarian, Bard, Cleric, Druid, Fighter, Monk, Paladin, Ranger, Rogue, Sorcerer, Warlock, and Wizard. So I believe the Warlock gives them one extra one from 3rd edition, and a couple of these others were not in the basic player's handbook of 4th edition, for example. Uh, so a lot of these were, well, rather, four of these were covered in the basic rules. Some of them have been sort of leaked before, and some of them may be completely new to people here. I really do quite like the Barbarian. I know that uh, from people who started playing 4th edition, or started playing Dungeons & Dragons in 4th edition, um, are worried that we're returning to a day when, like, oh, wizards are super uber powered and you know regular fighter types are boring and interesting uh, uninteresting and one dimensional and i really don't feel that that's the case actually to be honest i don't feel that was the case in third edition especially with all the various splat books and things like that um but uh here for example the barbarian i think is a beast an absolute monster of awesomeness um uh, of course the barbarian has the rage ability is a really sort of signature move uh he gets that from level one he can use it to start off with twice a day basically um and it lasts a minute what does he get during this minute well he gets advantage on all strength checks and strength saving throws he gets to add bonus damage to all of his melee attacks it's bar based on his barbarian level it starts off as plus two so gets an additional plus two to all melee attack damage and and this is crazy. He gets resistance, he or she, gets resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Half damage from physical stuff while raging. What? And a one minute duration basically means for the fight. I mean, fights don't last, generally speaking, more than one minute. For that one minute, the Barbarian is going to take half damage from everything that isn't basically like magic damage. That is insanely awesome. I love it. They also get the unarmored defense ability, uh, which basically adds their constitution modifier to their AC. So their AC, when unarmored, would be 10 plus dex modifier plus constitution modifier. And actually, assuming you got relatively good stats, turns out to be better than most armors you can uh, you can be wearing. The breastplate might be like the, the one little break point there. Um, but yeah, that is a lot of armor. And that is without having to take disadvantage to stealth checks, um, or, or anything like that. It is a very, very cool ability. You still get to use a shield while this is happening as well. Um, and I really like, especially at low levels, when armor is like kind of hard on the budget, it's very cool. I'm not sure exactly how this combo is with like saying, like wearing a magically enchanted robe or something like that, um, but it is really cool. Now, the new ability to me for barbarians, which is like the coolest part, I mean, the rage was awesome. Reckless attack. I freaking love it. Reckless attacks, you throw caution to the wind. You, before you attack, you get to choose whether you sort of are using this or not. If you use it, you get advantage on your attack roll. I believe it's only on melee. Actually, yes, it is only on melee. But you get advantage on your attack rolls. So you get to roll twice on your attack rolls. The disadvantage is if you've done this, then for the next round, anyone attacking you will get advantage to hit you. So they're going to be rolling twice to hit you and much more likely to do that. On the other hand, if you combo this with raging, hey, at least you're only going to be taking half damage. But what I love is when you think about the half orc thing, where on critical hits, a half orc will get times three damage, basically, instead of times two. Well, if you get to roll two dice on every attack, that makes it much more likely not only that you'll hit, but also that you will crit, which is beautiful, especially when you finally get down to the primal path. So there's a couple of different flavors of barbarian in the base book. There's the path of the berserker and the path of the totem warrior. Well, the path of the berserker, he also gets additional dice when he crits, which means like he's going to be a massive crit monster. Uh, also, at level five, the basic barbarian starts to be able to attack twice per round. And furthermore, later on, you can add additional attacks uh, per round by doing something. I'm trying to remember. There was a there was a thingy here. Oh, actually, if you take the path of the berserker while you are ra raging, you get to do an extra melee attack as a bonus action on each of your turns. So at this point, you're effectively attacking, say, by level five, you're attacking three times per round rolling twice on every attack, and rolling triple or even quadruple damage on the crit. Pfft, oh, insanity! Also, at level 7, you get Feral Instincts, you get to you get advantage on initiative rolls, and you, um, you're never surprised. Uh, you always get to act even during surprise rounds. What? 
What? How crazy is that? Plus, there's all sorts of other crazy stuff. Love the Barbarian. Uh, the Bard is very cool this time around. I mean, the problem with the Bard is always, A, the people who want to play Bards are usually really annoying. But also, um, unlike uh, unless you're like really sort of a functioning power, power gamer and can work out all the use magic device stuff and whatever, the Bard was generally considered to be a bit of a weaker class. Well, this time around, that is not so. They still have kind of the jack of all tradesy kind of thing, but they are full spell casters this time around. Uh, they have the same spell progression as, say, a wizard. They will be casting ninth level spells by the time they get to level 17. It is crazy, crazy awesome. Now, their spell list is slightly different. They don't have, like, all the nuky, blasty kind of spells. They have more utility and mind control-y and a little bit of healing stuff, uh, but that still makes them really good. At, at a pinch, they can make do for a wizard or a cleric, for example. Um, furthermore, they do get two different quote-unquote bard colleges to choose from. Uh, there's the College of Lore, which is, you know, the sort of brainy kind of one. Well, you get uh, proficiency in three extra skills, you gain additional spells. Um, also, the, uh, the the basic bard has this cool ability called Bardic Inspiration. Um, basically, based on their charisma modifier, but, you know, two or three times a day, they get to uh, inspire someone and that gives them an inspiration dice the die lasts for 10 minutes anytime during those 10 minutes when they're making a roll on a d20 basically they can choose to add this d6 to their roll but they get to add it after their roll so if you know you need to roll probably a 14 or 15 to hit something you end up with a 12 and you're like i will spend my inspiration die to add a d6 to the total so the bard can dish these out it is a bonus action to dish them out so you can do it mid combat uh to start off with this is basically that again but based on your charisma modifier so like two or three times per day but later on it uh, you get to recharge them during a short rest so now all of a sudden it becomes you know two three four five times a combat you can use your bonus action to give one of your allies a d6, I mean a d8, I mean a d10, I mean a d12, it scales up with your level. That is crazy good. Not to mention the fact that you are a full spellcaster. And listen, let's say you don't want to do the, the skill monkey magic thing quite as much. Uh, you don't care about the extra three proficiencies that you get from the College of Lore. Well, maybe you would prefer the College of Valor, which basically turns you into a fighter. It gives you proficiency with medium armor, shields, and all martial weapons. Uh, you can your, uh, your bardic inspiration, people can now apply it to their uh, damage dice instead, which is great. And at sixth level, you get to attack twice per round, uh, which basically puts you on par with fighters and barbarians and different things like that. Except you're also a full spellcaster. What? Uh, so the cleric is basically unchanged from the... Uh the basic rules, however, the big thing is there are more domains. The basic rules only included the life domain. Now there is a knowledge domain, a nature domain, a tempest domain, which um, in addition to being sort of lightning and storm uh, themed, also gives you proficiency with all martial weapons, plus heavy armor, uh, which makes you into a pretty good damage dealing beast. Uh, you can add thunder damage to your attacks. And also, if uh, someone attacks one of your allies who's adjacent to you, um... no, wait, that's not the way it works. When someone in melee with you and within five feet of you hits you with an attack, you basically just hit them with 2d8 lightning damage. There's a saving throw for half, but yeah, you hit me? No, 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 my friend. I hit you with lightning because I'm awesome. I also really love the trickery domain, which is just mind-blowingly awesome. You get the ability to, like, go invisible for a round, you know, instantaneously as a bonus action. Um, no, as an action, but you do get to go invisible for one turn just by burning one of your channel divinities, which is great. You can make an illusionary copy of yourself. Um, all kinds of really great stuff. And then there's the war domain. Again, gives you proficiency with martial weapons and heavy armor. And also, um, starting from level one. See, most people can do like a second attack per round starting at level five or level six. Well, no, as a war priest starting at level one, you can make a second attack per round, although a number of times per day based on your wisdom modifier. So basically three times per throughout the day, you'll be able to make two attacks in a round. But that is pretty beastly, especially at low levels. And of course, you keep getting more and more crazy, awesome abilities later on. Um, oh, here's a cool ability. Uh, starting at second level, you can use your channel divinity to strike with supernatural accuracy. When you make an attack roll, you can use your channel divinity to gain a plus 10 bonus to the roll. You can make this choice after you see the roll, but before the DM uh, says whether the attack hits or misses. That's crazy. So however many channel divinity uses you get per day, you can just add plus 10 to one of your attack rolls. Okay. Anyway, next up we've got the Druid. Druid, of course, is a full spellcaster this time around. Uh, I like how, like, one of the class features at level one is just Druidic. It's like, what? Oh, oh, okay, that's just the language to speak Druidic. And then spellcasting and... 
uh, starting at level two, you get wild shape. And really, that's the reason most people play druids. I want to turn into an animal. It was always so painful in uh, the pre-fourth edition uh, rules that required you to wait until like level six or seven to do it. Now, um, in fourth edition, you got a little sooner. Here, you get it at level two. So you can't just multi-class for one level and gain the ability to turn into an animal. Now, the wild shape abilities are kind of complicated and things like that. But at second level, you can turn into anything that doesn't have a flying or swimming speed. So for example, a wolf. At fourth level, as long as it doesn't have a flying speed, so now you can turn into aquatic things. And then starting from level eight, you can turn into any beast, including things that fly. So you can turn into like a giant eagle or something like that. As expected, anything, any um, uh, game effect that allows you to change your shape has tons and tons of text about exactly how it works. So we won't go into that, uh, but it is very cool. Also at second level, you do get to choose a druid circle to specialize in. Circle of the land or circle of the moon, for example. The circle of the land made up of mystic sages and who safeguard ancient knowledge and rights through vast oral tradition, yada, 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 yada. Uh, you get some extra spells, uh, better recovery of uh, spell slots and so on and so forth. It makes you a better spellcaster. And then the circle of the moon uh, allows you to use wild shape on your turn as a bonus action instead of an action. So obviously, it's the, the shape shiftery oriented one. You get some additional forms. You can go to higher like uh, CR ratings of, um, of monsters so you can get more powerful forms earlier. So do you want to be a spell better caster or do you want to be a better shape shifter uh ooh, starting at sixth level your attacks and beast form count as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magical attacks that's qu quite cool level 10 elementals what and at 14th level oh you get the thousand forms you can cast alter self spell at will i, I always love that ability i mean it's a super high level ability and it doesn't help you in combat but it feels pretty darn good uh, the fighter is going to be basically unchanged from the basic rules however there are more martial archetypes 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 i don't know anyway uh there's champion battle master eldritch knight or knigget as i like to say and uh yeah that's it oh the eldritch knights actually get spell casting what what you get cantrips and spell slots i mean they go slowly uh they only max out at fourth level but they do come from the wizard spell list um you can cast cantrips and first level spells starting from the first level or no third level as a fighter my bad of course you choose your uh, your fighter um archetype at third level but there you have it um very 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 cool little mix the champion i believe is the variant that comes in the basic rules so the battle master one gives you access to maneuvers um and uh, you get superiority dice and uh they start off as d8s and um Four superior dates expended when you use it. But what do you use it for? Probably as part of the maneuvers, which, which there's a huge list here. Commander strike. When you take the attack action on your turn, you can forego one of your attacks and use a bonus action to direct one of your companions to strike instead. Oh, that's cool. This makes me think of a lot of the fourth edition type of stuff when you're playing like a warlord or something, which is very cool. Disarming attack. Distracting strike. Evasive footwork. Fainting attack. Goading attack. Lunging attack. Maneuvering attack. Menacing attack. Parry. Okay. And it goes on and on and on. Listen, if you were a fan of fourth edition type of like special moves or even the um, uh, the tome, what is it, tome of nine blades, um, the, 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 the battle maneuvers book from third edition, uh, that might be the one for you. You have a crap ton of options. The champion is super simple. I think anyone who was criticizing how boring the fighter was is because the, the champion is just like, I am a fighter. I just hit things, derp, 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 but I do it very well. Uh, here you've got the battle master who's got a bajillion different moves that he can do. And the eldritch knight, which is like, well, I'm a fighter and I cast spells because I can. Um, we've got the monk. The monk is in the book. I like with one of the columns in their um, their grid is just called martial arts. Just starts at D4. Like, okay, so what is that? Uh, you do start with unarmed defenses at... Uh, oops, what page am I on? Martial arts, key, unarmed movement. I feel like I'm missing something. Where's the unarmed defense? Unarmored defense, rather. Unarmored movement. Oh, there it is. My bad. It's just tucked in at the top of the page. Uh, you do. It's just like the barbarian thing. You get AC equals to ten plus your dexterity modifier plus wisdom modifier as opposed to constitution. And yeah, there's martial arts. You you can add extra damage to your unarmed strikes. There's key attacks and all. Oh, there's so much text and things and evasion. And why are monks so complicated all the time? I guess it's because they don't get to use weapons. They gotta mix it up a little bit. There are a few different ways you can choose. There's the way of the shadow and the way of the four elements. The way of the shadow is nice and short. The way of the elements is super long and complicated it involves a lot of like elemental attacks you can spend six key points to cast cone of cold I, I, wow there's stuff going on hey 
Hey, a paladin. Let's move to them. Paladins are dumb. They must be pretty simple, right? Uh, paladin is a partial spellcaster. They do cap out at fifth level. Uh, other than that, they have, you know, a big pile of hit points and are generally kind of fightery. They do start off with Divine Sense at level 1, where they allow allows you to register evil about you, based on your charisma. You also get Lay on Hands, starting from first level. Uh, it allows you to restore a total number of hit points equal to your Paladin level, times 5. Um, and it does refresh, I assume, once per day. Let's find the line... Uh, you can restore stuff. Alternatively, you can expend five hit points from your pool of healing to cure a target of one disease or neutralize a poison. Oh, that's very cool. Oh, replenishes when you have a long rest. It's right there in the first sentence. Good God. This video is going on a little bit too long. You get to choose a fighting style at second level. You can do defensive, which gives you bonus to AC. You can take dueling, which allows you to do bonus damage. You can do great weapon fighting, which is just like the fighter thing, which allows you to reroll ones or twos on damage dice, which is pretty freaking awesome. And you can also do the protection ability, which allows you, if one of your allies within five feet of you gets attacked, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on attack roll. So you've got that sort of fightery. Yeah, I mean, you've always been sort of a, price, a priest, uh, or rather cleric fighter hybrid. So now you've borrowed some of those. And yeah, spell casting. Spell casting, oh, spell casting only starts at second level. Interesting. Again, probably just to dissuade some of the multi classers, for example, there. Uh, you do seem to prepare things um, as a priest. You basically know all the spells. There's a, spe a special paladin spell list, though. Uh, you cast spells with charisma, which is kind of interesting. You do get divine might at level two. You can expend a paladin spell slot to deal radiant damage to the target in addition to the weapon's damage. The extra damage, 2d8 for a first level spell, plus 1d8 for each spell level higher. Holy crap, if I were playing a, spe a paladin, I might never even cast a spell. I might just be like, I nuke you, I nuke you, I nuke you. Uh, you pick a uh, sacred oath at third level. Um which you get, allows you to choose between Oath of Devotion, the Oath of the Ancients, or the Oath of Vengeance. Well, every Jedi knows that vengeance is up down the dark way, right? Uh, the Oath of the Ancients is apparently a bit more of a fey kind of thing. You get animal type stuff in Staring Stripes, Speak with Animals, Moonbeam, Misty Step, and so on and so forth. Sort of a nature paladin. Uh, the Oath of Dove uh, Devotion, I think, is a little bit more of your standard paladin. Um... Your tenets of devotion, uh, devotion, honesty, don't lie or cheat, courage, never fear to act, and so on and so forth. So your standard boring paladin, lawful stupid, right? No. Actually, he's got some cool stuff. Sacred weapon ability, turn the unholy. He's got an aura of uh, devotion. You and friendly creatures uh, can't be charmed. Well, that's useful. Um, and then the oath of vengeance is the I hit you hard. Fight the greater evil. Uh, no mercy for the wicked. Well, those are the, the tenets of it. Uh, you do get some additional spells. You can abjure an enemy. Um, choose a creature within 60 feet. The creature must make a wisdom saving throw. Um, on a failed save, the creature is frightened for one minute or until it takes any damage. While frightened, the creature's speed is zero and can't benefit from any bonus to its speed. So it just sits there in place while you run up there and surround it and beat it to death. Well, that sounds like a proud paladin thing to do. We've got rangers next. I'm actually, I wasn't sure if there would be rangers necessarily because uh, the, there is a fighter variant that gives you bonuses to uh, two-weapon combat or archery. And I, I, so I wasn't sure if it was actually going to be included at the start. Um, again, you do have spell casting, very much like the paladin, starting at second level. Uh, the spells go up to fifth level. You do have your own spell list as well. Uh, classically, as a ranger, of course, you do get to pick a favored enemy. Um, you start with one at level one, and then you get an additional one at sixth and fourteenth. Um, so what do you get out of it? You get advantage on wisdom survival checks to track them, as well as intelligence checks to recall information about them. You get to learn a language about them. I was I, I was actually kind of expecting there to be advantage on your tax or something like that, uh, but maybe that would be a bit too powerful. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, natural Explorer you get later on. I like the ability, like, difficult terrain doesn't slow your group's travel. I really love that. Your group can't become lost except by magical means. Again, I really like that. When you're engaged in another activity while traveling, such as forging, navigating, tra and tracking, you remain alert to danger. Um, and if you're traveling alone, you can move stealthily at normal pace. And I, I really like that. Like, you kind of want one ranger in every group. Even if it's just like a hireling, get yourself a level one ranger. Seems like a pretty great idea. At level two, you do pick a fighting style. Uh, you get archery. And again, these are sort of borrowed from the things you saw in the fighter. Uh, archery would be plus two bonus to attack rolls with ranged weapons. You can take defense, which is a bonus to AC. You can take dueling, which is the plus two to damage rolls. And the two weapon fighting, which allows you to add your ability modifier to the damage of the second attack. Again, you get spell casting starting at level two. 
Um, and at third level, you choose an archetype. So, right, you choose the fighting style at level two and an archetype at level three, the hunter or the beast master. Uh, we're going to script straight to those. You do get an extra attack at fifth level um, and, and a few other nice Ds like that. So uh, under the beast master, you do get a companion right away. So again, that classic sort of fighter thing. Interestingly enough, the druid, if you're used to third edition, does not have an animal companion uh, this time around. And I think that's fine. In fact, what was always annoying to me is that the, uh, the, dru or the druid had such a great animal companion and the ranger had such a terrible one. Uh, so now, I mean, I don't know exactly how the companion will work in practice, but the ranger is the only one with it. So he gets to be the dude with the bear. Uh, in the Hunter variant, uh, you can uh, just basically do additional damage. Uh, you actually choose... That's interesting. When you choose Hunter, you actually choose a sub-variant of Hunter. Colossus Slayer, which deals 1d8 damage to things that are... Um, uh, well, to things that are injured. Hmm. The Giant Killer, that's with large or larger creatures. Um... If, some, if he misses you, you can use your reaction to attack it immediately, which is quite nice. And then the Horde Breaker, uh, when, when you make a weapon attack, you can make another attack with the same weapon against a different creature that is within five feet of its original targets. Good for killing a bunch of goblins. I do like the, uh, the Ranger. Now, the Rogue, of course, is in the base version. But what's more important is that there are more archetypes here. I believe it's the Thief in the basic rules, if I'm not wrong. Uh, there's also an Assassin variant, which gives you proficiency with the Disguise Kit and, and Poisoner's Kit. Well, that's a Always fun. You also get the assassinate level again at third level. Um, when um, uh, you have advantage on attack rolls against any creature that hasn't taken a turn in the combat yet, uh, very much the sort of flat footed uh, bonus from the old days. In addition, any hit you score against a creature that is surprised is a critical hit automatically, which is very cool. And it's got infiltration expertise and imposter and death strike. It's also an arcane trickster variant, which uh, third ed people would remember as a. Uh, I believe a prestige class, unless I'm wrong. I don't think it was a full 20 level class. I'm pretty sure it was a prestige class. So the Arcane Trickster class does give you spell casting, starting again at that third level. It does give you a handful of cantrips. You, your spells go up to level four. Um, and uh, you also get the, uh, you can when you cast Mage Hand, you can make the hand invisible and you can use it to do things like pickpocketing or whatever, which is kind of a very cool ability. Next up, we've got the Sorcerer. Now, the Sorcerer is interesting that he makes an appearance because, to me, in 3rd edition, the difference between a Sorcerer and a Wizard is a Sorcerer didn't have to memorize spells. In 4th edition, everything changed because the spell memorization mechanic went away, and they introduced the Sorcerer as a real sort of, like, primal, elemental um, magic user. Here, it's back in spirit a little bit more to how the 3rd ed flavoring went. Um... And the mechanics are in a way somewhat similar to a wizard uh, because the spell progression is the same as a wizard. You know, none of this sort of sorcerer being delayed the same way. Uh, but you do have to choose a sorceress origin right from level one. Your options are the draconic bloodline, which is actually very reminiscent to most of the backstory of the sorcerer in third edition, or wild magic. And who can't take wild magic? It's so awesome. Uh, there's also a weird mechanic with the font of magic where you get sorcery points. Um, you get sorcery points, you get two sorcery points when you start off with, and then you get more sorcery points as you, uh, as you level up your character. Um, and what you can do is you can cash in your sorcery points to regain a spell slot. So it gives you that sort of like instantaneous flexibility that um, sorcerers are used to. You can also um, trash a spell slot to gain sorcerer's points on a on a one-to-one -one basis that way so if you trash a level three spell you will get three sorcery points on the other hand to gain a level three spell slot it would cost you five sorcery points so um you know you're always paying a bit of a premium but it gives you some additional flexibility which is kind of a neat thing uh you also get meta magic abilities later on which is kind of neat careful spell distance spell empowered spell extended spell heightened spell quicken spell subtle spell and twin spell which is interesting because in third edition meta magic was more or less useless to sorcerers because of the extra casting time and other such nonsense um so it's really nice to actually see that in there. So the two origins, the Draconic Bloodline, is the idea that your Draconic magic comes from the fact that you have a bit of dragon blood, just just a sousson of dragon blood somewhere in there. You'd have to pick a specific Draconic Ancestry, which is, of course, associated to specific damage types. So black dragons are acid, blue dragons are lightning, and so on and so forth. Um, you get Draconic Resistance, uh, Elemental Affinity, Dragon Wings at level 14. Oh, yeah. And Draconic Presence later on at 18th, which is that sort of dread aura, which is very cool. But then you have the Wild Magic ability, which is crazy sauce. 
Uh, now, this is a bit less extreme than the old Wild Mages, but uh, yeah, when you... Uh, when you cast a sorcerer spell, force level or higher, you roll a d20. And if you roll a 1, you ha then have to roll on the wild magic surge table. So rolling every time you cast a spell, there's a 5% chance that you'll cause a wild surge. This can either make or break a D&D &D group, depending on your players. Um, and yeah, the Tides of Chaos is the other one. Um, when you make an attack, anytime you make a d20 roll, rather, you can just choose to gain advantage to it. Just period. It's like, oh, I have to make a dexterity saving throw? I guess I'll have to take advantage on it, which is awesome. Now, you can only do that once per long rest. However, here's the downside. Um, anytime before you regain the use of this feature, the DM can have you roll on the wild magic surge table immediately after you cast a sorcerer spell of first level or higher, so any spell that's not a cantrip. Uh, you then regain the use of this feature. So I don't like the fact that it's sort of, sort of the DM's choice, uh, and it'll depend on, you know, how sort of attentive to your particular class abilities are or you know how chaotic he wants it to be although certainly you can remind him of things but yeah so if you've used your tides of chaos there's the option of sort of automatically um automatically getting a wild magic surge which might be bad but awesome um in exchange for getting your tides of chaos back so, you know, it's kind of a pro and con. Obviously, you know, it's got to be the right group and whatever. And you got the ability to bend luck and control chaos and do spell bombardment and all kinds of stuff. The, the Wild Magic Surge table is great. It's a D100 table, so you know those are always good. Uh, picking out a random, a 57. For the next minute, any flammable object you touch that isn't being worn or carried by another creature bursts into flames. Well, that's pretty good. What about 19? You cast Grease centered on yourself. Well, that sounds like a fun time for a party. Uh, 83. Each creature within 30 feet of you takes 1d10 necrotic damage. You regain hit points equal to the sum of the necrotic damage dealt. That's amazing! Yeah, you might kill some innocents. It happens. You know, you gotta break a few eggs if you want to make a necrotic omelet. That's just the way it is. Next up is the Warlock. Oh my god, I'm way over time here. <clears throat> um, so, the Warlock is weird. Um, and works very, very differently. He doesn't have a spell progression table in any way whatsoever. Um, they're, like, the columns are simply cantrips knowns, spell known, that's a number, spell slots, which is just a number. One, two, uh, this is one at level one, two at level two, then it takes him to level 11 to get a third spell slot, and 17th level to get a fourth spell slot. And then the slot level goes one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, um, and then it's at level 9, you hit 5th level and it just stays there. And then you also get invocations. I don't think we can go into the details about the Warlock, but there's a lot of nonsense going on there, and they're a weird oddball class, which is exactly what the Warlock should be. Again, to me, much more reminiscent of the flavor of the Warlock in 3rd edition than the 4th edition one, and I love the 3rd edition Warlock. He wasn't really that powerful. He was just really cool. So hopefully there's some of that flavor still left in there. And then we have the Wizard. The Wizard, of course, is in the basic rules. Uh, but there are additional schools. There's one school, uh, ar an arcane tradition for every school of magic. I can't remember. I think it was the evocation that was in the basic rules. Now you've got div divination and enchantment and all kinds of that nonsense. Ooh, school of necromancy. Undead thralls. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. We have to do a necromancer. Anyway, that will bring us to the end here. There are um, there are some additional backgrounds and certainly a lot more spells. But um, all in all, I'm very, very, very happy with the player's handbook uh, as is. I'm really excited for this edition. I think that it is... Um, it used to be when people said, if you're new to D&D, to &D, ignoring 4th edition, because 4th edition is a little bit of an oddball. Some people love it, some people hate it. If you're new to D&D, &D, a lot of people are recommending Pathfinder, almost as D&D 3.75. It's 3rd edition D&D, &D, but better. Well, the 5th edition D&D, &D, to me, is it's 2nd edition slash 3rd edition D&D, &D, but much, much, much better. Obviously, without all the additional splat books and additional rules, really hardcore players might uh, feel like there's not quite enough variety in the game yet. Um, but so far, I love the way the, the rules have been streamlined while also making all the classes really interesting, and they all seem to feel powerful to date. Anyway, that is it. Uh, hopefully we'll have time for some more D&D &D content in the future. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. Also, leave a comment. Did you know I read every single comment someone leaves on my video? That's insane. Why would I do that? I don't know, but I'll read yours.